It is a wonderful day to do DFT. Turns out that every day is a wonderful day to do DFT, but today is no exception. And what I'm going to do in this mini tutorial is discuss a work example related to comparing the energy of different iron polymorphs. Specifically, we're going to use the code FASP or the Vienna ab initio simulation program to determine which is more stable, iron in the cubic phase or in the hexagonal phase. And the goal with this is that hopefully you're going to try it yourself you might reach some stumbling points and then you can check out the video to see where you went wrong or just to make sure you did everything correctly. And just to set the stage, if we wanna do something like compare the energies of iron in two different crystal phases, we have to do three different things. The first stage is we need to create an initial structure for both of those phases of iron that we'll then use for the DFT calculations. For those two initial guess structures, we then need to relax both the atomic positions and the cell shape and volume to make sure they're at their local minimum energy configuration. And then once we have that, we can compare the resulting energies to see which of the two structures is more stable and by how much. In this case, we are going to fetch our initial guess structures from the materials project. Uh, this is a data set of computed properties for about 150,000 materials. You could of course take known crystal structures of iron, and that would probably be the best thing to do in general. But here I just wanna showcase what the materials project has to offer. So if we go to materialsproject.org, you'll see this wonderful web page. Again, this contains computed properties for a wide variety of materials. You click start exploring materials, you can do just that. We'll click iron and then we'll do a little search here and uh, do it one more time because I think it just stalled on me. So we'll just refresh the page. And what we'll see here is a set of different compounds on the materials project. We have this structure up here for iron, which is the lowest energy structure, as you can tell by this energy above whole criterion. And this is iron in the cubic phase, okay, MP13. The star here indicates that it's experimentally characterized, or at least the starting structure was. So this will be our cubic structure that we use, and we're going to compare cubic versus hexagonal. So I go down here, and this will be the hexagonal structure that we take, MP136. And we already know, since this is a DFT computed database, that the cubic structure will indeed be more stable than the hexagonal structure, hopefully by about 0.1 EV, or EV per atom or so, and we'll confirm that with our own calculations. So if I click both of those, which I have already up here, what we see is you can have a variety of different properties that you can obtain from the materials project. You have this cubic structure for this MP13. Um, again, these are all DFT computed properties, and the hexagonal structure looks like this, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to click this button for export the structure and we'll export it as a postcard file. Okay. This is a structure format that is suitable for VASP. And I'm going to just rename this because we're going to download two of these and I don't want them to overwrite each other. I'll call this iron cubic. And I'll go to the other one and I will download this as a postcard file and call this iron hexagonal. And if we pull up these two postcard files in your favorite text editor, what you'll see is that you have the various lattice parameters, or strictly speaking, the lattice vectors, and you have the positions for each of the two iron atoms, and it's going to be different for the hexagonal and the cubic postcard files. Okay, so what we're going to do is click and drag this onto our favorite supercomputer. I'm using Perlmutter at NERSC, but obviously you will have your own. I will create two new folders, one that I'll call iron cubic, one that I will call iron hexagonal, and I will click and drag these to their respective folders. And I'm going to rename them just regular postcar because that's what VASP expects. Okay. So the first step of this process was create an initial guest structure. And we have that from the materials project. Great. We need to also set up some other parameters and files for VASP. Postcard was one of them, but there are three others. The INCAR that contains the input flags, the K-Points file that contains details about the K-Point integration grid, and POTCAR that specifies the pseudo potentials for your given atoms. And we'll take this one by one. Again, uh, this is mostly just to double check your own work, but I will go through this somewhat quickly. I'm going to create a file called INCAR. And in this handbook, there is a list of common input flags. 
I will go through these relatively quickly, but take some time to really dig into the, both the VAS manual and other resources to understand what each of these flags are doing. We'll start with a flag called NCUT, which is the plane wave kinetic energy cutoff. This is a parameter that you should, strictly speaking, converge such that if you increase that value, you're not really changing the resulting energy or derivable properties that much. Higher values will be more computationally expensive. Here we're going to just use a value of 520 just for the sake of this demonstration. But strictly speaking, after you're done with this exercise, you should go back and confirm that that value is appropriate. All right. We need to tell VASP the level of theory we're going to choose, and I will make this slightly larger for you. And that would be this GGA equals PE we'll use. PE stands for PBE, the PBE exchange correlation functional, and it is a pretty common but relatively inexpensive functional that we'll use for this demo. We need to tell VASP what algorithm to choose for converging the SEF, and we'll choose FAST because, well, it's FAST. EDIF is the uh, the criterion for converging the SEF in terms of the energy, and we'll do 1e minus 5, and that's the units of EV. I smear will set a 0. This is related to how we treat the partial occupancies and potential discontinuities near the Fermi level. And we'll do sigma equals 0 0.05 here, a relatively small value. Again, I'm not really going to go over what these are in great detail. You can certainly look that up yourself. I'm going to set this value to true, which is generally a good recommendation. Prec is for the precision, which we'll set to accurate because we like accurate results. And the real big heavy hitters here are the flags for the geometry optimization or the structural relaxation for these materials. So EDIFG tells you what is the force criterion you want if you provide a negative value in front. Generally speaking, I like to use 0.01 to 0.03 EV per angstrom. We'll do 0.03 for this example, and again, the negative sign just indicates that this is a force-based criterion as opposed to energy. We need to tell VASP what kind of algorithm we'll choose for kind of optimizing along that potential energy surface, and we'll do I Brian equals 2 for conjugate gradient. And we need to tell VASP which degrees of freedom we wish to optimize. In this case, we want to optimize both the atomic positions and the cell shape and volume, which is I sub 3. Two would be just for the positions. And in this case, we will set N as W to be 1,000, which is basically saying, I want to run up to 1,000 optimization steps. And if we haven't reached convergence, then just, just stop. It should hopefully take only one or two different steps here. So it's not a big deal. Now we're almost done, but there's something that's quite subtle when it comes to iron. And that is quite clear when we pull up the periodic table of elements. Specifically, if I go to ptable.com, my favorite periodic table, and we go to iron, right, you can see the electron configuration here. And with this, you should note that iron can exist in one of several plausible magnetic states. You could, for instance, have iron in a so-called high spin state where you have formerly four unpaired electrons per iron center. You could have some of these paired up when it's in a bonded solid or in a transition metal complex. You could have an intermediate spin state you could also have a low spin state where these unpaired electrons kind of pair up as well. So there are many plausible spin states and in VASP we need to consider this in our calculations. This is done with I spin equals two to indicate spin polarization. Anytime you do spin, we'll always do L orbit equals 11 to print out information about the spin states. And the key thing here is what is our initial, initial guess for the magnetic moments? In this case, because iron has formerly four unpaired electrons, potentially, per center, we will do 4.0. And there's actually two sites in our postcard file, if you recall earlier. So we'll do 4.0 for the first iron and 4.0 for the second iron. Again, these are just guesses, and VASP will converge to the nearest local minimum in the spin surface, if you will. And that might be close to four, or it might not. And it can also vary depending on what you specify as your initial guess. Strictly speaking, you should try all plausible initial guesses. In this example, we're going to just try four for each atom. And this is our INCAR. These are our input flags. All right, so we have the INCAR file, and I'm going to copy that to the hexagonal folder, because currently it's only in the cubic folder. Okay. Now we need to make the k-points file. 
Now I always forget what the key point structure looks like, so we are going to make that ourselves. The key points again contains information about the key point integration grid. And I like to use a code called pymatgen to do this, and there's a code snippet for making a good recommendation for the key points file. So I will share this in the in the description. But effectively, what we do is we import some modules. Give that a moment, and then we're going to initially initiate a structure object. And so we'll do from file, and I'm going to start with the cubic postcard file that I have on my desktop. If I do this, what you can see is that if I do structure, you have a description of the overall structure object, which is good. And we're going to initiate this K points object, which contains information about, well, the K points. And I like this function called automatic density by volume because you can pass in a structure and a value for the density of K points that you would like as a function of the lattice constants. And this will scale appropriately for different size systems. I like to start with a value of 100 here. If I were to print K points, you'll see that it is suggesting for this material a K point grid of 10 by 10 by 10 K points. So what we'll do is we will write this to a file. I will call that K points. And what we'll see in just a moment is that it wrote it to a file. Perfect. So I will click and drag that to the cubic section on my supercomputer. And I will do the same exact thing now for the hexagonal postcard. Hexagonal. And I've got to reinitiate that K points object now is 12 by 12 by 7 because the lattice constants are different for this material. And I will write out that to the k-points file, and I will click and drag that to the hexagonal section. Now I should note that this is a parameter, the k-point grid, that you should be converging just like n-cut. So you would try small values, maybe like 3 by 3 by 3 for the cubic, and then 4 by 4 by 4, and work your way up. And hopefully what you'll see is that the energy gets sm and either converges stops oscillating, and starts becoming a more precise value as you increase the k-point density. Of course, as you increase the k-point density, the overall compute time will increase, so there's a trade-off there and you need to find a good value for you. And this is generally just a good heuristic that I recommend, is using this PyMagin utility with an appropriate density like 100. All right, with that out of the way, we just have one more file left, and that is the potcar file, which contains the pseudo-potentials. This describes effectively how you're going to be treating the electrons in your material, so it's incredibly important. I can't share with you the POTCAR files because those are proprietary. Uh, they are property of ASP. But when you install ASP, you get a set of pseudo potentials as well. We are going to pull the pseudo potentials from this POT GGA POT PBE 54, or maybe called something slightly different on your system. Usually it's underscore 54 to indicate that it is a set of version 5.4 pseudo potentials. And so what we'll do is we'll look in this folder and you'll see that there's a whole bunch of different pot car files. I'm going to take the iron and what we see is that there's still a bunch of iron. There's an iron pot car, there's iron underscore PV, iron underscore SV, and these GWs. You can ignore the GWs, but what I'm gonna recommend is we do what VASP recommends. So we go to VASP recommended pseudo potentials. And what you'll see is that they have a list of, well, recommended pseudo potentials. And if we go to iron, what we'll see is the one in bold is the one they recommend trying first, and that is just iron, no underscore. Now, I, I suggest you check out what these various underscores mean. They're related to which electrons you include or not include in your valence. And so that is something you should always consider. But in this case, we'll take VASP recommendation to heart and just use this potcar file for just potcar.iron. And I will just call it potcar, copy to my current directory, and I will do the same exact thing for the hexagonal. And if I go here, I have the potcar file. Again, I won't show you the full potcar because of proprietary reasons, but if I do head potcar, I can show you the top, and it has some parameters related to iron. All right, we have almost everything we need. We just need to now submit this to the supercomputer. This is going to depend on your specific system. I am using Slurm. And this is again on a specific machine called Perlmutter. So you will probably have something slightly different. The key, the key thing that we want to consider that's uniform for all different types of queuing systems is what executable we'll use to run VASP. There's two, well, there's really three different types of VASP executables. 
two that you'll probably consider for most of your work, one called VASP standard or VASP underscore SDD and VASP GAM, which is VASP underscore GAM. VASP GAM is for the gamma point only version of VASP. It runs faster for one by one by one K points, but can't be run for a larger number of K points. In this case, as I showed you before, we had well over one by one by one. So cubic had 10 by 10 by 10. So we must use VASP underscore STD. Okay, refer to your corresponding supercomputer manual for details of how to submit jobs. We will copy this to both of the directories where we want to run our jobs and I am going to submit them. Now this is going to take probably about five or 10 minutes. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to pretend this is a cooking show. I'm going to cut straight to the final results in just a moment and we can continue from there. So I'll see you shortly. All right, I'm back, but you didn't really go anywhere. So that's okay. Here are the output files from running this calculation. You can see that there's a whole lot more than what we started with, which is good. The key output file that we want to look at is this outcar file. This contains various properties from the output of ASP. The top contains how many nodes you were using and the version. And what we're going to do here first is just mention a couple of important properties. One is this arrow zero energy sigma to the zero extrapolated. This contains the energy at each individual step. And if we go to the end, you can see the final energy and that's uh, this value here. So that'll be useful for later. We did a geometry optimization. So a couple of different things. If you search iteration, you can see each individual geometry and SEF step. So one, one indicates the first geometry step, first SEF iteration. One, two indicates still the first geometry step, but now the second SEF iteration. And you'll repeat this and you can see the energy go down and converge for that first geometry step. And then it moves to the second geometry step, updating the positions and repeating that process once more. At the end of the file, we can see hopefully some information about the convergence. Uh, usually it says successfully converged. So it says reached required accuracy, stopping structural energy minimization, which is a good sign. It means everything is A-OK. -okay. And the other thing I wanted to show you before we move on, is this magnetization X flag. Again, there's gonna be several of these printed out. We'll go to the last one. This contains information about the resulting converged spin states in our material. In this case, again, we started with a guess of four on each atom and it converged to a value of 2.1 or so. Non-integers are fine. This is perfectly okay. And in this case, what we have again is about two and change. So clearly we need to include spin because if these were zero, then all of our properties would be entirely different for this particular material, all right? So what we're gonna do, this is for the cubic structure. And I am going to copy and paste this into a new window. This is cubic and that was minus 16.487 EV, all right? Now I'm gonna go to the hexagonal structure pull up the out car. I'm going to go to that final energy, which was this value, hexagonal. And before we compare these numbers, the first thing you always need to do is always, always, always make sure you're comparing apples to apples. And what I mean by that is you're making sure that they are normalized on a per atom basis. In this case, if you go to the postcard file, both of these materials have two atoms. So they're actually already comparable, but for an EV per atom, basis will do just divided by two for both. And you can clearly see here that the cubic structure is indeed more stable. And let's get the exact value for how stable that is. Right, I'll just do cubic and here we go. And hexagonal equals like this. And if I do cubic minus hexagonal, what you'll see is that the cubic structure is about 0.09 EV per atom more stable than hexagonal. Okay, which is very interesting. And we'll go back to the materials project just to confirm our answer here. Again, what we found from the materials project was, open this up, that the cubic structure is indeed more stable. Go to this energy above hull. And the hexagonal structure is less stable by 0.1 EV per atom. And we got in this case, the hexagonal would be 0.09 EV per atom more stable. 
So nearly the same value as that from the materials project. It's not surprising we have slightly different values since we have different parameters, different in-car parameters, different pseudo potentials. But the fact that we are pretty much spot on is reassuring. You could also, for instance, compare the resulting lattice constants of these materials, which we'll do as well. Let me show you an example of how to do that. You would take the car file and you will paste that right into a program like VASP, for instance. And you can go to the summary and you can see here are my lattice constants, 2.83 for the cubic structure. And if I pull back up the cubic structure on the materials project, you can see they have 2.86. So again, we started with this structure and we, our converged structure is very similar, which again is reassuring. We can also take a look at the actual outcar file in a little more detail. If you use a program called ASE or the Atomic Simulation Environment, you can just do ASE GUI outcar and pull up the resulting trajectory frames. What you see is the structure here. And these are the frames of the optimization. There are three steps. They go forward, forward, forward. You can see how the cell and positions change very slightly. And here's the overall energy trajectory over a course of the steps here, the zeroth step, the first step, and the second step for a total of three individual steps. The last piece of the puzzle that I want to discuss is going back to the spin state. So if you recall, when I went to magnetization X, that had the different spin. This was for the cubic structure. Let's take a look at the hexagonal structures out car file for a moment. Here, you can see that the magnetization flags in the output file for the hexagonal structure indicates that the spin is zero, even though we put in spin with a magnetic moment of four on each atom. So for this case, what this suggests to you as the user is that most likely the ground state structure for this hexagonal system, at least at the PVE level of theory, is no spin or non-magnetic. Whereas for the cubic structure, it has a ferromagnetic state. And so with that, I'd like to just conclude by saying that hopefully I've shown you now how we can carry out this little exercise of comparing iron phases, specifically the cubic and the hexagonal phase. We use VASP to carry out structural relaxations of the positions of the cell shape and volume, found that the cubic phase is indeed more stable than the hexagonal phase, compared it to the materials project, showed that we knew what we were doing, so that was good. And hopefully you now feel a little bit more confident in carrying out some calculations on your own as well. So that's it for this time. Enjoy your DFT.